a few. Welcome. We're just going to wait a few moments to allow folks to join. While we're waiting, it would be great to put your name, program, and your role in the chat, just so we can get a sense of who's here. Carla, Robin, for those that are just joining, if you could just introduce yourself in the chat, name, program, your role. And we'll just give it a few more moments to allow folks to log in. Great, I see some program managers, directors, data coordinators. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think we can probably get started. Um, welcome again to our first um, boot camp. So, New Year's boot camp for MCH training programs. We are so excited to offer this. This really came out of a need, particularly for new LEND programs, to understand NEARS, how it's related to the performance reporting progress or reports. Um, and really just an understanding of all the different offerings of NEAR. So we're very happy to be able to offer you a four-day boot camp. We know it's a lot of hours and a lot of learning. So we appreciate um, your participation um, quickly. My name is Jackie Sizia, and I'm the Senior Manager for ITAC, which stands for the Interdisciplinary Technical Assistance Center on Autism and Developmental Disabilities. And we will introduce my colleagues in just a few moments. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Please ensure that your name is displayed correctly in the participant list. You may also include program, organization, and preferred pronouns. Um, to do this, you just hover over your name in the participants box and select more and then rename. We do ask that you remain muted unless speaking and to please state your name prior to speaking. This is to help ensure accessibility. Um, we ask that all questions are entered into the chat. We will try to answer them as we go. There will also be some space for questions throughout. Captioning and ASL is available. Um, if you need any tech or accommodation support, please email nears at aucd.org and you'll reach our entire team. Today's session is being recorded and will be archived. Um, I know that some of you will be attending some of the sessions and maybe not all of them. So all of them will you have access. All the materials will be accessible to you um, within a few days of the actual bootcamp. And if you haven't already, please introduce yourself in the chat. So name, program, and role. I gave a quick introduction, but just wanted to tell you a little bit about ITAC. So ITAC is sponsoring today's boot camp and the rest of the boot camp sessions. We are a technical assistance center and we of AUCD and we support the autism cares programs. Um, particularly, we provide technical assistance to LEND and DBP programs. Um, you should have received a copy of the slides. You will see a QR code. You can go to our website. If you're interested in learning more, you can email me directly, and I'll have my colleague, Rachel, put my information in the chat. So I know that some of you already put some information in the chat about yourself, but we do want to get a sense of which programs you're coming from. So I'm going to start a poll. Um, there should be two questions. What type of MCH programs are you affiliated with? And you can check all that apply. And then the second question is, how many years of experience do you have working in NEARS? I'll give it a few minutes. Ah, 
How about six years? You have more than six years. That's fantastic. You aren't even in the poll. You can put that in the chat. If you have more than four years of experience, please add that to the chat. That's fantastic. I know we have some long-term folks here. Okay. I'll give it 85% of you. I'll give it one more minute. There should be two questions that have come up. Which type of MCH training program are you affiliated with? You can check all that apply and how many years of experience in NEARS. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. We have a good amount of LEND and LEND folks are also associated with the USED. That's fantastic. We have a few DBP folks. None so far from PPC, and we have four LEA. Great, and we have folks that either work for MCHB or AACD. And then in terms of years of experience, we have a lot that are, it's, I would say between six months and a year is our lowest, only 4%, but we have a lot that are six months or less, one to two years, and three to four seem to be popular. And it seems that a few of you even have more experience, which is wonderful that you're participating in this boot camp. Um, if you have more, feel free to add that to the chat. Oh, I see 15, 15 years. Wow. Fantastic. I do just want to introduce the rest of my team. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Jackie Sizia, and I'm the senior manager of ITAC. Um, I will allow each member of my team to introduce themselves. Um, this is really those that work on our MCH technical assistance team, as well as support you through NEARS. So Brandon, I'll let you take it away. So thank you so much, Jackie. Very excited for our first day of the boot camp. Um, my name is Brandon Lewis. I'm the data support manager at AUCD. Um, I've been working in years, some closer to seven months now um, as well. I've been supporting everyone um, with all of the always amazing questions that everyone has. I'm so really excited to be here. I'll, Great. I'll go ahead and allow Rachel to introduce herself too. Hello, everyone. I am Rachel Miller. I am a program specialist on the ITAC team at AUCD, and I will be assisting with uh, any technical assistance needs you have today during the boot camp, um, and I will be monitoring the chat. Thank you, Rachel. And it appears that my screen crashed, so give me one second as I share my screen again. So I think Oksana is also on the call, too, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Uh, yes. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Oksana Klimova. Um, uh, I started work at AUCD 14 years ago. My background is mathematics and computer science. In my current position, director of web and IT services, uh, I provided, I oversee a uh, NIRS application and uh, um, such as architecture, development, and uh, maintenance of application and databases. And that's just Oksana being humble. I would say, if you know Oksana, she is the mastermind behind NEARS. So everything that you have today is due to Oksana. Thank you, team. I mean, it's team effort and our network uh, definitely playing a huge role in our funders and grantees, uh, 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 grant office, uh, MCHB. Um, thanks to everyone. I'm just front end of technical implementation. Well, we thank you. And um, absolutely, it is a team effort. So we have a big day today. Um, of course, we're going through welcome and introductions now. We'll have a brief for those that may have six months or less of NEARS, of what is NEARS, the benefits. We will hear from MCHB to talk about DGIS and performance reporting requirements. 
Um, we'll talk a little bit more about what our partnership with MCHB looks like and that NEARS DGIS overview and schedule. And if these acronyms, uh, if you're not familiar with these acronyms, I promise we're going to go through these. Um, we'll have a short break and then we'll go through administration of NEARS accounts, information about the directory data set, managing activity staff, and then talking through homework and next steps. I am now going to turn it over to Brandon. Um, Brandon is just going to give you an overview of future boot camp sessions and then um, and talk through um, the learning objectives for today as well. Take it away, Brandon. Okay, so thank you um, so much, Jackie. Um, and again, a huge welcome for the first ever um, Nears Boot Camp. Um, and so for the for future days of the boot camp, day two is going to be really geared towards just a whole day of diving into uh, the trainees um, and trainee surveys. Um, day three uh, will encompass uh, projects, activities, and products. Um, which, if you're brand new, you may not necessarily you know know what those are yet, but promise we will go through those. Um, and then day four um, is uh, geared towards advanced NEARS, um, completing the autism um, cares modules um, and the import and exporting processes in NEARS. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, but for today on day one, um, we uh, our learning objectives, what we want everyone to be able to know um, for today um, is that um, you'll understand the relationship between NEARS and DGIS and what both of those are. Um, you'll also be able to understand um, and how to create NEARS accounts and logins um, at, at your individual programs. Um, and you'll also understand how to manage your directory profiles um, and how to uh, manage your activity staff as well. Um, and so first off, what is NEARS? Um, NEARS stands for the National Information and Reporting System. Um, it is a secure web-based application that helps AUCD and network members and centers uh, to manage their data and, and training programs, project activities, um, products, um, and helps uh, with the compliance of federal reporting requirements. Um, currently, there are 77 MCHB training programs um, that use NEARS for reporting that ranges from DBPs, LENs, LIAs, mm -hmm. um, and so on and so forth. There is no cost associated um, with using NEARS, um, and that doesn't matter for how many years you use NEARS. It's, fear, uh, it's free regardless of how many years um, you store data um, in the program. Um, and uh, other applications on the market uh, may cost for that historical maintenance, um, but we do not for, the, um, for using NEARS. Um, built, NEARS was built with the specifications of the federal funder, um, meaning that it is that the data entered is already in the format when that the federal funder desires whenever um, it appears for your federal reporting. Um, and then AUCD also coordinates um, with MCHB to help with the import process um, and the EHB, um, the electronic handbook, which is EHB's um, re reporting system. And this helps with decrease in uh, duplication of data. Uh, NEARS also has uh, pre-built reports which provide quantitative and qualitative data that can be used um, for reporting. Um, it is accessible throughout the year and has TA support. Um, we also give you ownership of, in, of the storage and the historical data that you enter into NEARS. We do not own that. It is completely yours. Um, you can also use NEARS to help in leveraging network expertise. Um, and then there's also a public search tool that you can use to highlight um, your, um, your, your work that, that your center does. And there is also the AUCD online directory that has provided you as well. Great, thank you, Brandon. And I did just want to put an emphasis on uh, a few of these. So I think having NEARS accessible throughout the entire years, I know that for those that are familiar with the performance reporting process through EHB, um, you know, you only have it's open at a certain time and then you have a certain time period to complete it. Um, so hopefully you're collecting that data all year round, but NEARS lets you see that data and you have a access to that data all year round. 
Um, I also know that I think my colleagues, if they haven't already added the public search, um, but you're also able to see there's many times that I get questions of who in the network is doing this. And it's a very large network. And so sometimes I can put in keywords of, you know, I'm looking for this type of expertise within the public search. And I'm like, oh, this program, it's Michigan Lend, or, you know, I can see um, a variety of options for that request. And so I also recommend that as MCHB programs that you utilize that as well when you're looking for someone in network with a certain expertise that um, that information is available. I don't know, Oksana, did you have anything to add? I just want to say that uh, we also provide TA support, and I could not stress uh, <clears throat> that benefit because uh, I'm personally familiar with multiple um, services that you can use online, but here you have actually unlimited access to the to Brandon, who uh, can help you. Uh, with data collection, and also you can you leverage my expertise if you have difficulties. Um, and we're also using this to customize um, near. So we're listening to you. We we're running all your feedback. We're tracking that feedback, and we try implement this as much as our budget allows us. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Jackie. Yes, we would not be able to do our jobs without Oksana and Brandon and the support that they provide. I know many of you use that NEARS at AACD email to get in touch with them. Great. I am actually now going to turn it over to Caitlin Bagley from the Maternal and Child Health Bureau to provide information on DJIS and performance reporting requirements. Caitlin, if you're online, I can't see you, but take it away. I'm here. Hi, Jackie. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm Caitlin Bagley. I am in with the Division of MCH Workforce Development. I'm the project officer for about eight of the LEN programs and all of the LEA programs. And I also support our performance measurement and data teams. Um, so yeah, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. So DGIS, or the Discretionary Grant Information System, is the electronic data management system that resides in HRSA's Electronic Handbooks, or EHB. Awardees report a variety of information, including financial data, demographics, grant impact, quality improvement, health equity, and training program data. And MCHB uses the data to monitor awardee progress and make improvements to our program's policies and practices. So that's just a brief overview of DGIS. Um, next slide. Thank you. Um, there are three different types of performance reports you'll encounter over the life cycle of your grant. The new competing performance report, or NCPR, is due during the fall of year one of your grant. In this report, you'll see you'll set goals for the upcoming five-year project period. The non-competing continuation performance reports, or NCCPR, are due during the fall of years two through five. Um, you'll report on each of the performance measures for the previous budget, budget period. So for example, in the fall of year two, you'll be reporting on year one data. In the fall of year three, you'll be reporting on year two data, et cetera. Finally, the project period end reports, or PPER, are due during the fall following year five of your grant. In this report, you'll report on performance measures for year five of the project period and the overall impact of the grant. Um, note that if you successfully recompete your grant, you'll have the PPER from the previous project period and the NCPR for the current project period due in the same season. Um, I also want to note that when we're talking about NEARS, NEARS is relevant for the non-competing continuation performance report and the project period end report. So you won't use NEARS for the NCPR, but you will use it for the NCCPR and the PPER. And if you have questions on these going forward, don't hesitate to reach out to your project officer. I know it can be very confusing. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to touch really quickly on some changes to performance measures coming up in 2023. Um, many of you may have heard this information previously, but just in case. Um, so we're in the process of making changes to our performance measures to be more inclusive and reflective of equity language. 
This was informed by the CDC Health Equity Style Guide, um, and the table on the slide has some examples of updated language. In 2024, we anticipate releasing a new package of data forms that includes a form to capture inclusion of individuals with lived experience in MCHB funded programs. For LEND and DBP programs, this will be an opportunity to further demonstrate the impact that um, including individuals with lived experience has on their programs. Um, next slide. Thank you. Um, one significant update to our forms that we're, is that we're in the process of creating more inclusive um, gender categories for our trainee faculty and staff forms. Uh, the sex field has been changed to gender, and we've added a couple more inclusive response options. We know we still have a lot of work to do in this area to make our forms as inclusive as possible. So if you have any feedback, please let your project officer know, and we will definitely take note. Um, these changes are going to apply to medium term, long term, and former trainee and faculty and staff forms. Um, you'll receive more communication from your project officer soon, hopefully in the next week or two, um, with more detailed information on all of the performance measure changes. We've created really detailed summary sheets that go over what the changes are for each individual form. Um, so stay tuned for that. And next slide. Uh, this is just some resources on DGIS and performance reporting things. Um, I will pop these links in the chat. Um, but the first one is for the just the DGIS webpage on the MCHP on the MCHP um, website. Uh, then there's a web page on more specific reporting requirements. Um, then there's one for program specific performance report forms. And on this page, you'll find um, a form for each program detailing the specific performance requirements for that program. Um, I've also included a link to the DGIS user guide, which is a really in-depth resource on, um, I believe it's on the EHB website, but accessible without logging in, um, to all of the MCHB performance measures and forms. And finally, if you have any questions on performance reporting, you can always reach out to your project officer. And that's all I have. So I'll pass it back to you, Jackie, and I'll be around if anybody has any questions on performance reporting things. Thank you so much, Caitlin. I don't see, I'm just trying to make sure I'm not missing anything in the chat. I just opened it. Um, yes, so the slides were sent out um, through this. You should have received an email from Brandon. So that also has the links, but Caitlin, feel free to add those. Um, I do have um, a couple comments just for MCHB. So other is usually not a good option for this related to gender, but something a little bit, making sure I can see more like not represented above. Um, and then um, Giassi who asked who your project officer is. So your project officer is, and I welcome MCHB to jump in if you have a more proper definition, is your point of contact for your grant. So every LEND has a project officer um, where you would direct your questions to. Um, that is your main contact at MCHB for your particular grant. So uh, Leah, for instance, uh, Caitlin is uh, the project officer for the Leah grantees. Uh, Caitlin, as mentioned earlier, is a project officer for eight different LEND programs. Um, I don't know, Caitlin, did you have anything to add to that? Um, I'll just add that if you're unsure who your project officer is, you can look on your most recently released notice of award, and that should have the contact information for your project officer listed there. Thank you, Caitlin. Great. If there's no other questions for now, um, I did just want to have a brief couple moments to talk about our partnership with MCHB. So AUCD partners with MCHB staff to facilitate the timely transfer of data collected in years into your individual recipient's performance reports. Um, as Caitlin already mentioned, this goes into MCHB's electronic management system, also known as DGAS, um, which resides in electronic handbook. So MCHB's participation in this process, let me say MCHB funded programs participation in this process 
is completely optional. There are some programs that decide not to go through with the export import process, which I will go through in the timeline in a few moments. Um, NEARS is the available tool that is open to all AZD network members. So everyone that's on this call that's an AZD network member, you've communicated with Brandon and Oksana, this is a tool that you can use. That doesn't mean that other centers have other tools that they may use. Um, as we mentioned earlier, there's lots of benefits to, you, to NEARS. I would say nearly all of AUCD network members do use NEARS as their, their go-to tool. But just to know that this is not, um, we're not forcing you to use NEARS. This is just an available tool. I also just want to reiterate that NEARS and EHB is not the same thing. I know there's lots of confusion um, about the difference between NEARS and EHB. Again, we use NEARS as an available tool that you can store your data, analyze your data, export your data, and import it into the EHB. MCHB does not review that, um, MCHB does not review any data that's in your, in your NEARS account. So this is important to note that the only data that MCHB reviews is data that's submitted through your EHB. And we can talk a little bit about the NEARS DGIS export, but just that's an important note. Um, and then in terms of what gets transferred in this process is that ACD provides the trainee, which also includes the trainee surveys and the product data sets, which you'll learn about um, in day two, to MCHB for that transfer to DGIS. And then I just received a question. Um, that I just wanted to reiterate, there are non-AUCD members, for instance, PPC, LIAs, that they NEARS is an available tool because we provide TA, and that's in our agreement with MCHB. So just to note that if you don't consider yourself an AUCD member, we do, but <laughs> if you don't consider yourself an AUCD member, um, you still have availability to use NEARS. I'm going to move forward. So another important aspect of our partnership is that AUCD works with MCHB to ensure that any changes in federal reporting, performance measure changes, such as some of the few things that Caitlin just reviewed prior, is also reflected in NEARS. And this really helps the coordination between both NEARS and the EHB. In terms of roles, so AUCD provides technical assistance. And I know Oksana talked a little bit earlier about the technical assistance that's available to you. We do this through data entry. We provide technical assistance on the data import, export process, data analysis, really helping you to manage your data the best way you can. Um, however, I think sometimes we often receive programmatic questions, such as, does this trainee count as a LEND trainee? Does this use a trainee count as a LEND? And we're not able to answer those questions. Um, that information of, for instance, just for this particular question, you should always go back to your NOFO, which stands for Notice of Funding Opportunity, which details very carefully, for instance, and I'm just using LEND as an example of what counts as a LEND trainee. However, all those programmatic questions should be directed toward your MCHB project officer. And I believe Caitlin already mentioned how to get in touch with your MCHB project officer, and many are on the line here today. Additionally, um, we've worked with MCHB on a specific NEARS module that was really developed for LEND and DBP programs to collect and report on their autism spectrum specific related training and clinical activities under the Autism CARES Act. Um, for those that have gone through this process, you know it already as the CARES module. Um, this information is exported from the CARES module annually. So we typically do this and we collect this information or open it up in July and it's due by August. Um, and we share this information with MCHB. We'll talk a little bit more about the CARES module in day four of the bootcamp. I mentioned this earlier, but just wanted to reiterate uh, for those that are familiar with NEARS or have already logged in and you see different data sets, um, such as the training data set, the products data set, um, what is exported from NEARS and transferred to DGIS 
um, is include your trainees, trainee surveys, which again, we'll go through at the next boot camp, and products and publications. So just want to make sure of what information that's included. So you may include even more <laughs> information in here, such as activities, but that is not something that is transferred to DGIS. I did want to walk through the timeline of what this generally looks like. And while the dates may change year to year, the general timing does not. So, um, and we'll talk about trainee surveys, but those are due um, to MCHB as part of your performance report. So those are due at two years out, five years and 10 years. And so all trainee surveys must be entered in NEARS by the end of June. So that's typically June 30th. We do recommend, and we can talk a little bit about this tomorrow, is that you start sending out those surveys to your trainees, I would say by the end of this boot camp, so by February, to make sure that you have enough time for them to respond. By end of July, all data to be exported must be entered in NEARS by the end of July. And we'll give you that date, so you'll get communication from Brandon with all the timelines. But essentially, you need to make sure that any data from your project year that you need exported in time for your performance reporting is done so by the end of July. By the beginning of July, we start a new NEARS year, <laughs> um, which is when the prior project year closes and you enter data for this new year. So. At that time, what happens is that Oksana in the beginning of August exports, cleans, tests the data, and then sends it to MCHB. By mid-August, MCHB program staff ensure grantees participating in the export, again, as I mentioned earlier, it is optional, have performance reports that are in progress status in EHB. In early September, that NEARS data that I mentioned earlier is uploaded into the EHB and MCHB staff notify grantees that that data transfer is complete. And before your performance review report is due, so typically in October, um, grantees have the opportunity to log into the EHB, review their data, and there's additional sections that are in the EHB as part of your performance report that NEARS does not export. So there's like a financial section, for instance. So it's important that you complete those other sections. I did wanna note, because we often get questions about this timeline, that for instance, um, maybe programs, their data hasn't imported yet um, from NEARS to their EHB, but they wanna get started on things. Perhaps they wanna start the financial section. We recommend that you do not touch um, your EHB until that data transfer is complete and you've been notified from MCHB that it's been complete because there may be an instance where you put data in and then it will wipe it out with the import. So it's important that if you have concerns, you communicate that to AUCD staff and MCHB project officer. But that is the general timeline. Before we take like a, a five minute break, I did just wanna open it up for questions. And I see Robin, thank you. MCHB usually sends a message when it's safe to enter data for the fall performance reports. Yes, so it, you just wanna make sure that you're not entering any data before that. And I see, thank you, Robin, is <laughs> putting all the information. So, and no foes and notice of funding opportunity, which lays out all the programmatic. Um, requirements for your grant. Um, Debbie, so can we touch on activities if they don't get transferred, then do, if they don't get transferred, then do we have to transfer them? Um, that, no, you do not. I don't know, Oksana or Brandon, do you want to touch brief? I know we're going to have a whole conversation about activities, but do you want to touch on activities at all before we go on a quick break? Just touch base on this. <clears throat> we, uh, uh, there is activity data set and uh, uh, 
will collect data through the years. Some day, uh, those data will be very helpful to answering questions in the form in HB report form. There are some questions. Based on your collected data, we create standard reports that you can run the years, see the responses, and copy those responses into your reports. So with the short answer, we do not transfer activities, but data, the reports on those activities, can help you answer the reports in AHB. So I just want to add on there too, uh, trainees and products those are the two data sets that we'll transfer into the EHV as well. Thank you both. Any additional questions before we just take a, I know we went through a ton of information in a quick amount of time, just a two minute break before I'm gonna hand it over to Brandon to start really our first session on NEARS accounts. And so how about we give everyone until 240? How about we come back at that 240? Perfect. If you have additional questions, you can put those in the chat. And I'll walk through, make sure I didn't miss anything while I was speaking. Oh, sorry, Katie, I saw that when we we'll break, we want to copy the dates. Sure. You also should have a copy of the slides in your email too. Got it, Katie. And the one thing I'll just add that's not in this timeline is what I just mentioned briefly is that um, you should, most programs we recommend sending out those trainee surveys in around February. Um, it's really up to your program, but just to give enough time for responses. And for any other data coordinators that have been doing this six or 15 years, feel free to add to the chat if you have, if you found a certain process to work. Um, but we found that mostly in February, that's a great start date. I should quickly plug in promotion for the list serve. So there is a data coordinator list serve. That's a great resource. Uh, so if you're not on that list, I would highly recommend to get on that list because you as a community can solve any questions. So in, in relation to trainee surveys, different centers have different tactics and strategies, and uh, this is the place where they can share with you most efficient way to collect trainee responses. Absolutely. That's a great point. And if you if you're not on the data coordinators listserv, um, you can email nears at AUCD.org and we'll make sure that you are added. But as Oksana mentioned, the NEARS data coordinators are a great resource for those that are new LEN programs in the past year or so. Um, I've, I know I've connected you to multiple uh, data coordinators, so they're a great resource, particularly for those that have been in the network for a long time. All right, I hope you've had some time to stretch, um, get some water perhaps. I am now gonna turn it over to Brandon to talk about the administration of NEARS accounts. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I will let Brandon take it away. Actually, if we could please have another one or two minutes of a break, actually, I am getting our captioners set up with permissions. Oh, absolutely. You have one more minute to stretch, grab some water.
Oh, um, Jackie, actually, could you um, have uh, ASL interpreter um, as co-host? Um, they are needing it to um, do what they need to. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, again, my name is Brandon Lewis. I'm the Data Support Manager at AUCD. Um, and so it's my pleasure um, to uh, do the demonstrations for today and introduce everyone um, and get started in NEARS. Um, and so, um, at the before the boot camp, um, you have um, gotten an email from me um, instructing on um, how to log into NEARS. Um, I just want to put in a plug uh, to make sure uh, to use the correct links uh, whenever um, you're logging in for the boot camp. We made separate logins for everyone um, so that you can get the hands on experience um, for the homework. Um, and um, if you want to follow along, that's also an option too. Um, so, um, First, I wanted to start off um, um, so and so the um, first thing um, that you'll want to know um, is how to um, log log, log into NEARS. Um, and so first, if you're a brand new program, um, then you'll want to first message NEARS at AUCD.org. Um, there's a, qu quite a lot of information that you'll need to um, provide us, like the program name, department, organization, um, postal address, um, and so on and so forth. Um, but if you're a brand new program um, and just ask, how do we gain access to NEARS, just let us know. Um, that your new program, um, then uh, we'll walk you through that process and set up the accounts for you. Um, and we'll include um, in the welcome email, the link to NEARS, um, name, humor, program, and center. Um, and uh, you also need to let us know um, the NEARS administrators that you would like access um, in NEARS. Um, and the Emails will be um, encrypted um, and, and your credentials um, will um, be uh, per password protected as well. Um, and so I wanted to show you how to first access NEARS. Um, so a a NEARS can be accessed on the AUCD um, home website. Um, and then you can uh, go down to here to NEARS. Let me zoom in a little bit because I realize that's really small. It's too big. Okay. And so on the left hand side, um, you'll say NEARS, and then there'll be a login option. Um, you can click on the NEARS login page, um, and uh, then you'll be able to click in this drop down box and select your um, center name. Um, Again, we're using a different email for the boot camp. Um, and so I'm going to use the link that was sent in that email, and you can double check that that is the correct email because it'll the correct link because it'll have test web instead of www dot um, and the very start of the website name. I mean, so again, I'm going to uh, first select uh, which center I'm logging into. If you're a Lend or USAID, then you'll uh, default to this link um, for Lend and USAIDs. If you are a PPC, LIA or DBP, then you want to click um, here next to that. And then after that, you can uh, scroll down and select your center. And we provided everyone with a AAA uh, test center login um, for the boot camp. Um, and then you can put in your um, username and um, login information. So I'm going to go ahead and log in for us. This is a difference uh, screen that um, you'll see. I'm uh, logging in with my AUCD Uber account. 
Um, and so you will just be taken straight uh, to this dashboard. Um, and so whenever you get to this dashboard, um, you'll see quite a number of uh, different aspects. Um, you see today's date um, and the number of records that are entered in for each of the data sets. Um, and then what, what do I mean by, by data sets? Um, in, in NEARS, um, all of these data sets are up here at the very top of the screen. Um, trainees, projects, activities. Um, they, they, these are what we call data sets. Um, data sets are separated out into individual pieces of information, um, topics of information um, that you're capturing at your program. And so, for example, um, in the trainees data set, um, these are uh, trainees in your training program um, and the trainee surveys. In the projects data set, um, those are the funding and collaborations um, at your um, program or center. Activities are what you are doing around those funding dollars in the community and in your training program. Projects um, are what came out of those activities. Goals, uh, those, that's actually an outdated data set and we'll be skipping it during the boot camp. Um, the directory uh, data set allows you to manage your online AUCD directory. Um, and modules are tools for federal reporting um, and in the data import export process. And that is all managed in the admin data set. Um, and each of the data sets is set up in the same three ways. Um, there's a section for data that can be entered um, by faculty or staff or the data coordinators um, that have access in years. There is a data search for each data set. And then there is a list of reports, um, which can be um, useful for searching um, or also as an AUCD tool. Um, that can be um, very helpful um, for re reporting purposes um, or for, uh, or yeah, and for, for reporting purposes. Um, and so I want to jump back over to our um, AUCD um, homepage just very briefly um, before we get started in the rest of, of NEARS. Uh, on the AUCD homepage, we have um, a lot of resources and a wealth of information um, for you to explore and to use um, for whatever benefits um, that, that you have um, at your programs. Um, for NEARS, we have a lot of uh, TA sheets um, that, that can be used, and those are located under resources, located in NEARS, and then NEARS resources. And that will take you to a list of uh, tip sheets um, and other helpful um, pieces of information that you can use. Um, and that goes on down the page. Um, you can kind of explore these as we go through the boot camp. And so again, that's um, resources, NEARS, and the NEARS resources. And so I'm going to jump back over to our um, NEARS again. Um, and so after you have um, set up your account, we've given you access um, and set up your accounts in NEARS, you log in for the first time. Um, and so maybe you want to change your password, and that's actually very easy to do in NEARS. Um, and so over here in the corner where it says, welcome, uh, Brandon Lewis, it'll be your own name whenever you look at this. Um, there's an option to have a, your to change your password, and, and that's um, a very easy way just to change your password um, if, if you need to. Um, a quick note that uh, passwords are case sensitive, um, and so whenever you're logging in, you want to make sure that um, you uh, pay attention to the casing whenever you're um, making uh, the logins for your program. Can I just ask a quick question? Yeah, go right ahead. Um, this is uh, Jossie Burks Abbott. Um, when I clicked on the link you put in the chat, um, I actually got the regular page, my the, my lend, my um, NEARS account. I didn't get the test page. 
Um, maybe we can put the test website in the chat, please. It probably is because he's already signed in as himself. If you open it incognito, it should work. How would I do that? Uh, you can just do a Google search for incognito, um, and then um, it'll be the first option. Don't like press enter. You can just um, press incognito or open up a different browser. Like if you're on Microsoft um, Fire, Firefox, um, then uh, pick Chrome or, or something like oh, that. Okay. It should work. Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Okay, so um, after you've um, updated your password um, to whatever um, you want of your personal information, um, NIRS administrators um, may also manage access um, for everyone in NIRS as well. Um, and so we typically recommend um, that every person who is using NIRS um, or managing the data running reports will have an account um, with the username and password that is unique to them. Um, and so the next step um, for your program will then uh, will be then to create accounts for everyone that you attend to um, use the program. And this can be a very strategic decision as well. Um, some programs choose to designate a centralized data coordinator is what we call them, um, who will be responsible for managing all data um, that is entered into NIRS, um, whereas other programs um, may want to divide and conquer. Um, they'll want to enter uh, logins uh, and create logins for people um, so that they not, not all of that work is just settled on one person. And so if you're designating one centralized person, there are a couple pros and cons, um, such as centralized data management um, and maybe a higher consistency and um, data entry, since it's only one person who is entering that information. Um, if you have multiple people entering, um, there might be an additional um, training piece that you'll need to do with faculty or staff. Um, there might be some data quality checks, um, but again, there will be less burden on the data managers um, to complete all data entry. Um, and so to manage NIRS users' logins. It's managed in the admin data set. Again, you need to have um, NIRS administrative access in order to access this. Um, whenever we initially give access, we'll make sure that um, administration is provided um, for those first users. And so uh, you can manage new users and admin data set, manage NIRS users' login. Um, and then you'll come to this a page right here. Um, and then uh, you'll need to uh, create a new login for them. And you can add a new login at the very corner that says in the, in the big blue button. It will come up with a new page with login, password, first name, last name. Um, and so the login is the username that they'll use whenever they log in. Um, their password information um, can be whatever you wish it to be. Um, and then you can enter in the rest of the information. You'll come down um, and then come down to level of access. Um, and again, this can be a very strategic decision. The level of access is detailed at the very bottom of the screen. Um, and so you can kind of um, review those and make that decision um, for um, how you best want your program uh, to enter the information. Um, and we'll have uh, more practice with that as we go through the um, through the boot camp. Um, and so, like a read access, some you'll only though those will be only able to view all data fields um, except for personalized or um, contact information um, and, and so on and so forth. The next piece of information will be the data sets that you'll need to give them access to. Um, and this is as well a, a very strategic decision. Um, 
And so whenever you're giving access, you want to think about what kind of work you want your faculty member um, to be working on. If it's only trainees that you want to give them access to only the trainee data set um, or, or how, however you want to do that. Um, and then um, after you've made your selections, um, you, you can also choose to give them directory manager access. Um, and, and what that means is that uh, your online AUCD directory, um, it can also be managed directly in NIRS. And so if you wanna give a, a faculty member access to the directory data set for everyone in your program, you wanna make sure that that is also checked as well. Um, and so then save the screen at the bottom of the page. Um, and then um, you'll have created your first account um, and then you can um, log out of NEARS, log into that account um, and see that um, everything has um, changed. Um, you can also go back to the same screen um, and make sure that all of your selections have changed. Um, so go back to admin, manage users, log in, find the name and the drop down, and then you can make sure that all of those selections have saved correctly. If you select the directory manager, um, then the DERB manager will be will have a yes next to it. Um, and so um, that, that can be a very easy check um, for, for you as well. Um, and so I have talked a little bit about the AUCD online directory. Um, and so I just wanted to show everyone what I, um, what I, I, I meant by that. Um, and so the directory is designed to assist um, the network um, with federal and state agencies and the general public uh, to very quickly identify people um, based on their interests and expertise. Um, data from the directory data set is propagated into the AUCD online directory um, and the projects and the products data set. Um, profile data um, from the additional information section um, is not displayed um, for public users. Um, and so again, the directory is public facing um, and assists policymakers and stakeholders across the network to find contact information within the network. It can again be accessed um, from the AUCD homepage. Um, and then uh, you can go down here and click on the ITAC team um, for MCHB um, training programs. And then because I'm a little zoomed in, I'll need to um, click on about and program directory. I'm going to maybe zoom out a little bit. Okay, so give me just one second here. Aha, there we go, okay. Um, and so then you'll see a, a list of programs. I mean, you can search by, by different fields. Um, if you are uh, just looking for the um, for like a particular program, you can select um, which program you're looking for from the individual states. Um, and then, uh, as I um, also said, in NEARS, um, the projects and products data set also um, link with the directory. And I'll point those out as we go through them and the, and the boot camp. Um, Okay, and so I'm just gonna uh, click on a, a random account um, and um, I'll, I'll view their center just to kind of show you what the online directory looks like if you've never been on here before. Um, and hopefully uh, Dr. Sarah O'Kelly will forgive me for using her profile as an example as the first one who came up, um, but you can kind of click into her profile and you can see what she's kind of written here um, and, and so on and so forth. 
Um, so hopping uh, back over uh, to NIRS, um, just as a quick introduction for um, the online AUCD directory. Um, but as, as I mentioned, um, the information can be managed directly on, in the directory data set. Um, and it contains um, information such as um, the programs and centers um, profile um, and the list of all faculty, staff, and profiles. Um, and so um, whenever you first send us the, uh, your, your initial information, we'll ask you for um, like your logo and your um, center information. Um, and we will set that up for you, but you, you can also change that at any time that you want. Um, and so that information is managed in the directory data set, manage center information. And then you'll scroll down a little bit and you'll see uh, your center information with all of that, um, all of that data that, that you sent us. And so on the directory, you also see that same information it, it'll be listed at the very top of your profile. Um, and in and, and the same format the, that it's sent up in, in, in NEARS, which is a really cool and um, really um, fun um, thing that, that can be managed right in NEARS. You can customize um, your own profile based on what, um, how you want to market yourselves. Um, and so if you wanna edit the information, you can go into NEARS and press on this edit button. It'll take you into the forum and um, you can update the information or um, change any of the information that you want. Um, and then just click um, save at the bottom of the page once you've um, finished um, adding all of that information in there. Um, and then let's say next that you want to um, add new faculty profiles. You want to set up new uh, profiles for your faculty, your brand new um, program. Um, and so that again can be managed um, directly in years um, in the directory data set. You can click on add faculty staff profiles and it'll take you into the form so you can create their profile. Um, and then I did also want to mention um, that the faculty can also create um, their profiles directly on the AUCD directory, um, and I'll go through that as well. Um, but first, I just want to be consistent, and we'll, we'll go through the nearest form first, and then we'll go through how to add in that information um, directly um, on the, um, the, the directory as well. Um, and so um, whenever you click on directory data set add faculty staff profile, um, you'll see a, a bunch of different fields that you can add information into. Um, just a quick note that um, fields that are required are noted with asterisks next to them. Um, and so you wanna make sure that all of those fields are completed before you can save the screen. Um, you'll also notice at the very top of the screen, there is two options on the right side. Um, you can do, you can go straight to the directory search, um, or you can go uh, to the dictionary, um, which will have helpful um, definitions um, to enter information if you have a question on the field. Um, and of course, you can always reach out to us at AUCD. Um, sorry, nears at AUCD.org if you have any questions. We're always happy to help. Um, and so I'm just going to demo putting um, in information and I'm just going to enter my own information um, for um, just for uh, a demo sake. Um, and so enter my first name, last name, phone number. Um, I can put in my um, address. Um, and then uh, you'll come down to the username and password field. Um, these can be used um, for each individual person so that they can manage their own profile whenever they come back to it later. If they want to make edits, um, then you actually don't need to do that for them. Um, they can log in with their own credentials. Um, and so um, you can uh, create an email, I mean, a password for them if you want to, um, or if they have one that they want to specify. Um, the address will automatically default to your program, um, but uh, you can click on the checkbox and identify a separate one um, if, they, if they have a separate facility that they would like to designate. 
And then you can identify any of the um, positions that they have. Um, at least one selection is required underneath of this field in order to save the page. Um, it's separated out into different uh, sections, leadership, um, administrative staff, activity coordinators. Um, just kind of look through here and pick whatever you feel is most appropriate. We have a lot of options here. Um, as Oksana said, we've listened to feedback over the years. We've made a lot of additions in here um, to try to make it equitable for everyone. I and mean, if you have any additions, feel free to send us a message. We're always open to any feedback. Um, and so for me and by background, um, I'm going to um, select um, public health because that's my background. Um, and then you can um, add in any other um, contact information that you feel um, is appropriate for you, um, as well as um, your primary um, discipline. Um, again, I, I am public health, so I'm going to find that in the drop down list and identify that. Um, if you're a part of any other disciplines, um, then you can also um, identify that on the form. Um, and so, for example, um, epidemiology or family services, so on and so forth. If you're part of any of the memberships on the councils, you can also identify that. Um, and then just like a, any kind of other profile, you can create like a, your own uh, like bi biography um, as well. Additional section, additional information section is not included on the directory. All of this information is completely um, confidential. Um, you note that those uh, additions that uh, Caitlin Bagley from MCHB noted have already been updated on the form. And so you'll note that those are already there. Um, and so um, you just kind of go on through the form and uh, make your selections of race, ethnicity, um, and then at the bottom of the page, you can save the screen. And um, for you said in Lens, this will be a different field on the administrative field at the very bottom of the page. Um, DBPs, LIAs, PPCs, um, you won't see this field, but if you're specifically both a Lend and a you said, you'll see this option. Um, and so you just need to select them um, based on which uh, staff member um, and where, where they are, your center or your program. This member staff and this member status option is very, very important. Um, that this will dictate how that profile is displayed on your directory. Um, and so display will mean that the profile is displayed in the online directory. Do not display um, will mean that it will not be displayed in the online directory, um, but it will be preserved for historical purposes. I mean, so as I said earlier, the a directory also links with your projects and your products. And so if you're wanting to uh, maintain the historical information um, in those two data sets, you can note do not display. Um, if, for example, a faculty member has left or you want to remove them from the online profile, um, that, that's a way that you can uh, maintain um, the data that's in NIRS, um, but maybe uh, not have them displayed in your directory. Um, inactive um, is a, another way it will be hidden, um, but again, maintained for historical reasons. Um, pending permission, waiting approval, and rejected, those three options are reserved um, for people who um, have submitted their profile um, using the other option that I'm about to um, demonstrate, um, which is from the AUCD online directory. Um, this will require an administrative um, process um, after they've submitted, um, then you can review their profile um, and make the determination if you want to um, approve their profile or if you want to reject um, and so on and so forth. And so I'm going to make sure to save my selections. And then um, you can review the information on this page too, make sure everything looks okay. Um, and if you need to make edits, you can edit the uh, profile again at the bottom of the page. Brandon, 
Yes. You've received quite a number of questions. Uh, so in the chat, which I've been um, just capturing, can we pause for a minute to address some of these questions before you move forward now that you've saved the record? Or do you want to move forward or do you want to go to another section before we address questions? Um, I have not looked at uh, the questions, but sure, let's go ahead and, and, and do a few. Let's go. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so the first question is, is there are people in our NEARS login list who are no longer with our program. Should we just edit their access levels or should we delete them from the list? If we delete them, will that erase their links to historical data they edited or anything like that? Uh, so that is an excellent question, um, and actually one that um, we've gotten very, I promise you're not the only one who has um, been asking that question as well. Um, and so for, for the new data coordinators on, on the call, I did want to specify, I just wanted to clarify really quick um, that your NEARS administrative access that I just went through at the very start of the demonstration managed in the admin data set, that is separate from your online AUCD directory. Um, and so I, I just wanted to put that out there first. Admin data set is for access in the application. Directory is for your online AUCD profile. Um, and so I just wanted to put that out there first. Um, if we're talking about the manage um, NEARS users login, my approach is always to restrict access. Um, I would not recommend deleting their profiles, um, just simply um, restrict their access. Um, and so um, here I can show you what I mean by that. Um, and so you can um, go on here and um, like edit the, their access. And um, I, I realize I haven't gone through how to edit the profiles yet, but we'll, we'll, we'll get there. And so you can, um, Click on here, remove their access and change their level of access um, to read only data sets, goals only, and then make sure a directory manager um, is also unselected as well, then save the page. If you want to go the extra mile, you can also change their password as well. Um, that's also an option too, that way they don't um, know what their login is anymore. Great, thank you, Brandon. Okay. Yeah. And just the general rule that Oksana has always told me is never to delete. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think if you're able just to restrict access or any of the other methods that Brandon discussed, uh, that's what I think we would recommend. Um, Jassy put, uh, with the directory, you can search for people as well as programs. I think that's- uh, Yes. Job. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like, why, like we um, showed earlier, you can go to the directory, you can search um, for each state if you have a particular program in mind. Early, I clicked on Alabama and then I clicked and view program to go into their profile. Or the other option is that you can go over here on the right side of the screen and if you have a particular expertise or if you have a last name or first name, you can search for all states um, and search for them that way. Yep. Perfect. Um, we have another question in regard to entering a profile. It says, with respect to entering a profile, it looks like we cannot save a partial entry. That is, we have to complete all the required lines before we can save. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, if it has an asterisk next to the field, here, I'll go back into the data set again. Um, and you can see if like first name has an asterisk next to it, meaning that it must be filled out. It must have something entered into that field in order uh, to save the screen. Perfect. And then I think we have one final question. Is there a difference between do not display versus inactive? Why would you choose one over the other? Um, and so she's referring uh, to this uh, question um, right here. Um, and that is also a very good question. Um, and so the, it, it, it has to do, it's, so let, go right ahead, Jack, or Oksana. Yes, let me jump in, um, just be sure that we, we got it kind of straight. Um, it was requested by data coordinators and the situation in the center can be potentially uh, following. You have employee that, 
they left and uh, you really, uh, or you don't want that employee. Um, and because they left, you don't want that name displaying online uh, directory, but there are still work that the employee done. So uh, in that case, you select do not display in online directory. But there is a actually opposite situation that you may want uh, display that employee in online directory for whatever reason, but you want internally, when you look at the list, you want mark that person that it's not actually a part of your center anymore. In this case, you will select inactive. So there is kind of struggle, um, like tune up status of that employee. And uh, after debating, we, we just establish those two uh, statuses. I hope it's clear. I know it can be confusing, but. Thank you, Oksana. Thank you. Um, I think there's one question that's gonna be relevant for later. Um, so um, I'll do Jono's first, and then I think, Brandon, I'll let you go ahead, because I think the activity staff um, will we'll get to. So is there a place we can find that all of the different member status, oh, let me make sure I'm reading this correctly, is there a place where we can find what all of the different member status on directory bullets mean? So I'm assuming it's the the display, do not display, inactive, pending. Like, what does that mean? Is there a place where they have definitions for that? Um, I, I'm happy to send that information. Um, if um, I just message me at um, nears at AUCD.org, um, and I'm happy to send that information. Absolutely. I mean, the we're talking about uh, bulleted points uh, on the directory profile. Okay, uh, the quick question, uh, the quick answer, the top, the bottom three, rejected waiting for approval pe pending submission. Um, faculty staff can complete, can apply to the center and they can complete online uh, profile on their own. When they complete profile, it will come to the directory. And you as administrator will be able to see that profile and the status, member status will be checked as waiting for approval. And it will be up to you to make decision what to do with that profile next. So you can check display. And in this case, it will be active profile that will be displayed in online directory. You can select do not display. It will still be active profile in your directory, but you will not display this in on a UCD website directory online. And you can click inactive. Uh, it's kind of your option, not, not super logical, but it's you will see profile and it will be inactive in your center, but you still have this listed in your directory. So the free top options, it's related to the program display on in directory online on the UCD website. Free bottom ones, pending, waiting, rejected. It's your decision about application that faculty and staff submitted to you. Thank you, Oksana. And, uh, you know, I think we're always, and as we get questions <laughs> um, throughout this entire process, we're going to be looking at what we need to improve in terms of TA or communication. And so um, I will, of course, put this on perhaps the wish list if we don't already have it in the directory of what these items mean. Um, I believe Kelly's question will be relevant as we talk about the activity staff, which I know we're going to get to later. Um, I will continue to monitor questions. I will, um, of course, alert Brandon when we have a great collection of questions as we go through certain points. So feel free to continue to add them to the chat. Um, before I hand it over to Brandon um, to move to the next section, I just wanted to alert you <laughs> that I know that many of you had issues with the test accounts. Um, just so it's not lost in the chat, if you are having issues with the test account, I know Oksana is working on the back end one by one to make sure it's working properly for you. 
Um, if you could just email nears at AUCD.org, that way we just make sure we're not going to lose anyone that's mentioning it in the chat. Thank you. And Brandon, I'll let you take it away. Okay. So thank you so much, Jackie and Oksana. Uh, okay. Um, so um, now that we've gone through entering data directly into the directory data set in NEARS, um, I want to show you how to submit a new profile um, using the AUCD online directory. Um, and so again, um, I'm just going to use Alabama as an example. And so um, for, for your first, you want to go to the directory page, um, and then you want to find your program in the list. Um, select the states um, that you um, are located at, um, and then um, view their program. Um, and then you'll come to their profile. A little bit farther down, right before you get uh, to the different profiles, there will be an option that says, not in the directory yet, um, register to manage your profile online. You want to click on that hyperlink and it'll take you into the form. Um, okay, and we will look into Maybe it's my internet connection. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know why it's not opening it, for me. <laughs> it, it's, it's, uh, this is a brand new website, so it's glitch that we need mm -hmm. to fix. If you go to the AUCD website and you will start there. Mm, okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. And we um, do have a link. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Oksana. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, no, that's okay. Um, and so th we have... Uh, for MCHB training programs, there's the ITAC website, and then there's also a separate um, login for ULINs and USEDs that we also have on um, the AUCD homepage as well. And so ju just to demonstrate this, you can follow the same process on the ITAC. Um, and so I'm going to use Alabama again as our example and go view a program, and then there's this hyperlink register to manage your profile online. And then this will take you into the form. A lot of these questions will look maybe very familiar to you that are familiar with the directory data set. Um, and with the form that we just went through in NEARS, and so I'm just going back at the very top of that um, profile that we just were in, in in the directory data set, you'll see first name, last name, phone number, and then in the directory, um, whenever we went into the form, you can also see those same questions. Um, and so you can, that you can have your um, faculty member, you can send them this link and uh, just have them uh, enter that information on their own. They can designate their own leadership positions um, and scroll down on the page um, and so on and so forth. Um, and then once they've made all their selections, um, they can, um, if they, not able to finish it all in one sitting, they can save it um, for later and then return to finish their profile. Um, and then that's what you'll see if they press that button. The status symbol will say pending submission. And then if they say save and submit, and then it'll be say waiting for approval. Um, and so the, that's the two different ways um, that you can submit um, profiles um, for your online um, AC directory. Um, and so um, now I, I want to walk through, um, well, what if we want to make an edit to um, a profile on the AUC directory? Um, and so you can add faculty, new faculty members are going to add faculty. You can go to directory data set, manage faculty for profiles who are already entered into the IUCD online directory or who are pending profiles. Um, 
you'll see that it's set up. You can see their name. You can see manage account da data information. Again, I'm on the test center, so none of this information is real. Um, status, um, you don't need to necessarily enter into their profile uh, to change their status. If they're pending submission, um, then you can just click here under status and you can click on display or not display um, or however you want to do that. Um, and, and that's a really easy way to manage their profiles. Um, now, if you are wanting to edit their information directly in NEARS, um, then you can click under manage. Um, you can find their name in the drop down and then uh, click on um, the three dots and that'll come up with a couple of options. Um, and that'll come up with an edit option, which will take you back into the directory form where we just were, um, so that you can make edits and so on and so forth to the profile. Um, and then you also be able to see any projects or um, products that are linked with them if they have any, um, as well as a view option that will just take you into a, um, a view format of the information that's um, that that's entered on into their profile. And all data sets are set up in that same fashion. Um, if you want to add a new record, you can click on add uh, under manage the data set, or if you want to manage existing records, um, then you can um, do that the same way. You can go into manage and then click under the manage field and click on the three dots. Um, I, all of the different data sets are set in the same way. And that is also true for the admin data set. And so if you go back to the manage nearest users login, if I want to make edits to a profile, I can find their name in the drop down and I can click edit or I can um, and, and then I can go in and I can edit their prof I mean, their admin permissions um, and so on and so forth and then save the screen after I finish changing my selections. Okay. Um, and so there are um, also a, a additional, uh, and so now, now that we've gone through how to add in uh, profiles um, into the directory and we've discussed how to manage um, their, their um, information and the data entered, um, I did also want to uh, point out a use, another useful and really interesting um, tool. Um, there are two things over in the view data that are set up in each data set, which are very, very helpful. Um, standard reports um, are predefined reports um, where the report's contents is fixed um, and data coordinators have specifically requested this information. Um, and so we've um, pre-populated those for you so that they're just really easy to run. You can get the information very quickly. Custom reports um, are um, reports that can be created um, by data coordinators or um, and where you can define the information that you wanted included in those reports. And so in the directory data set, I'm just going to demo this really quickly. Um, there are a couple of uh, standard reports that you might find um, really helpful. Um, if you're a PPC, LIA, DBP, um, and these will be the standardized for um, your, your programs. Um, if you're both a USED and a LEND, um, just note that you'll see this additional um, piece here, um, program type that you'll need to select um, based on if you're searching for LEND and USED or only LEND or only USED staff um, and so on and so forth. Um, and since we are in the directory data set, we are searching for staff. Um, and so um, you, you can just kind of um, search through here. All data sets are set up um, so that you can just search across all the information. Um, I just clicked on the very first one, faculty staff information MCH reporting. Um, and that brought up a really nice, um, easy to read, um, a report that has all of my faculty information, race, ethnicity, um, discipline information, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, 
Um, and so, and, and if you want to have um, faculty certified across a race and ethnicity, there's also a really nice um, standard report for that as well. Um, and, and you can kind of um, go through here. Um, there are also um, a uh, data entry errors um, standard report that is set up into each of the data sets, and we'll revisit these throughout the boot camp. Um, but this is a really helpful standard report. Um, if you're having the question, you know, is there any data cleaning that I need to do? Um, are there any fields that have been left un, um, un, unchecked or um, incomplete? Um, this is where you can go and you can see, you know, who needs um, that, that information edited, what fields need to be, and you have information entered into it. Um, and then you can go back and you can go find the faculty member and um, either encourage them to enter that information, or if you know that information, you can also make those additions too. If you want um, highlighting that information for the network. And so um, that's standard reports in a directory data set. Um, and then there's also uh, the uh, custom reports. Um, and so let's go over the process of creating a custom report. Um, you'll first want to make sure uh, that there is no standard report that already exists before creating a custom report. Um, it just so that um, the, you know, you, the standard report's already populated for you, it's much easier just a few clicks away. And so the very first question that you want to ask yourself for any custom report is that you want to first um, formulate your question. What, what are you trying to ask? What information are you trying to find? And then you want to understand the data that will answer that question. Um, the custom reports are set up um, into different categories. If there are no categories, um, then uh, then it'll just be the no category. Um, we recommend uh, to create your queries um, based on, on different categories and you can, and I'll show you how to set that here just in a minute. Um, to create a new report, um, you can click on the big blue button, create new report. Um, and then it'll take you to create the custom report. Um, we recommend creating a unique title. Um, for our example, I'll um, use what names included in our directory have the letter M in the first name. That'll be our question. Um, who of our faculty has um, the letter M in their first name? And so I'll create a um, title, um, faculty with letter M in their um, first name. And then this is where you can um, create a category. And then I'm just gonna create a category that I feel is appropriate, um, faculty by letter for our example. Um, notes is also very helpful and something that I found um, very helpful for me. Um, if you need to come back to it later, you can make any notes to yourself um, about what the stand, about what the custom report is for, what its purposes are. I mean, you can kind of create little reminders for yourself. And then now we come into selected fields and then the selection criteria. Both of these will be set up in similar fashion. Um, in selected fields, these are the pieces of information, the pieces of data um, that you want to include in the report. And they're always notated in the same way. On the left side of um, selected fields, these are all of the options that are included in the data sets. And then if you want to include an option, you can click on these arrows and it will take it onto the right side. On the right side are the fields um, that are selected for the report. Those are the pieces of information um, that will be included whenever you run the report. And you'll notice that there is a specific um, format that they're in. Um, and so first it's like a contact, um, which is 
where it originates, what, what data set or what table is coming from in the, in the application. Contact is synonymous with directory profile record. Um, and so whenever you see contact, you'll know that it comes from the directory data set profile. Um, and then after that, it'll say the name of the field. And so first links with the first name, that very first field in the directory data set. And then after that, it'll in parentheses have the field type. Um, T means text, new, N will, name, N will mean it's a numerical uh, field, I'm sorry. Um, and so for our example, I'll do first name since we're searching for a faculty with a letter for M in their first name. And then selection criteria are how you want to refine that information in your search. And so I, I'm looking for faculty who um, have M in their first name. Um, and so I want to select contact first name and then there's a bunch of different options here. Like can be a very nice selection uh, for text fields because it'll return all, all, all fields with similar spelling. And then I can just put in the letter M in the last field. And then save the screen. And now you can see we have a new category. Um, because I created a category whenever I created that um, custom report. And so then you can click on the plus or minus, um, and that'll bring up the different um, custom reports they have created. You'll see the name of the report, um, and then you can choose to um, present the results in. Um, browser um, can be, uh, is, is my preferred method of presenting the results. Um, it's just how it will appear in your um, browser whenever you run the report. Um, you can also choose to download the report if you want to. Um, and then um, you can click on the three dots under manage just with all other data sets. Um, and then you can either choose to run the report. If you want to make edits to it, you can choose to edit um, or you can copy and delete it. You can make a copy of the report, but we'll just create a full copy of it. And then um, you can uh, make any additions or edits um, in a new form. So I'm going to go ahead and run it just to demonstrate what it looks like. And so then you'll see the results of our query. You'll want to double check at the very first thing. Um, whenever you run custom reports, um, if it's over 50, then you'll want to make sure that you um, are showing all results. And you can do that by just by entering the number that it shows, record count one of four. And then you can just enter show, enter the number and refresh, and that'll show you all the results. And so we've run our first custom report together. Um, and so, um, and that pretty much wraps up um, the directory data set. Um, I did want to um, pause here and see if we have any additional questions really quick. Hi, Brandon, this is Jackie. So we have a lot of questions that are related to the activity data set. Okay. So I think once we go through that, um, we can answer some of those questions. Um, but I will take this opportunity <laughs> just to mention, because I know that um, some people have been messaging me, is that um, for folks, um, you all should be part of the Boot Camp 2023 NEARS MCHB list, that APD listserv. I know that's very lengthy, um, which is as participate participants in the boot camp, you will receive emails from Oksana and Brandon with just homework and other details and information about the TA sessions, which Brandon will mention that later today. Um, but if you could refrain as much as possible from replying all, that would be fantastic. So if you hit reply, it will go to the entire listserv. But if you forward and send it, if you have questions for our team, whether that's you're trying to get into your accounts or you have other issues, um, you can forward to our team at nears at ucd.org. 
So I know that a lot of people are overwhelmed <laughs> by the amount of emails coming through that listserv. Um, so I appreciate you just um, trying as much as possible not to reply to the entire listserv, unless it's relevant to everyone on, uh, as a bootcamp participant, but um, as much as possible to try to forward to our team directly. Um, thank you. And I will save some of these questions because they're related to the data activity data set uh, until okay. you go through that, Brandon. Okay, absolutely. Can okay. I say one other quick thing? Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. Um, I just noticed too, if you just normally reply, it'll also reply to the whole listserv. You don't have to hit reply all. Um, so just, just be careful. Just don't reply to the main emails. Like they said, use the other methods. So just, to, just so you know. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Drake. I appreciate it. Um, okay, um, and so since we do have a lot of questions on the activities, um, uh, on uh, the uh, activity staff questions, rather, um, I did want to backtrack a little bit um, because I, I did mention that um, the directory data set does link with your projects and your products. Um, I don't know if that was a question that we had, but I did just want to show really, really quickly um, where those are. Um, and we'll go through those again on day three again. We'll, we'll touch on them a, a, a much more in depth than what, what I'm about to. Um, and so in the projects data set, um, I'm just going to add a project really quick. Um, and then I just want to show where this um, field is. Um, and so on the contact field, you can link it with specific faculty. I mean, this um, will link with your um, directory data set. And that's near the top of the screen. And then in the products data set, um, I'm just going to add a random um, product. This is the field. Oh, it's um, near the bottom. It's near the bottom of the page. And the ordering information at the very bottom of the products data set. And so those are the two places where your online AUC directory can also link. Um, and I want to get too granular because I know there's a lot of information that we're <laughs> where we're introducing in a, in a short amount of time. So um, I'm, since we're also getting um, a lot of questions about the activities staff, um, I'll go ahead and show um, how uh, those are linked in um, the admin data set, actually. Um, and so there are three separate profiles, um, like I mentioned in NEARS. Um, there's the ones that you create to give access in NEARS. Um, for your data coordinators and other faculty staff. Um, and that is that was the very first one that we went through. Um, that was the manage nearest users login. Um, and that's for logging in to the application itself. And then we have your AUCD online directory, um, which is used to highlight um, your work and your expertise um, in, in, in the network. And then the third kind um, is to manage activity staff. And that is also in the directory data set. Um, and this is linked with both your um, both with your um, activities and your products, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> um, and, and the staff involvement um, lists. And so as you're entering information into those, um, you'll notice that the list and some of the fields um, will be different for your faculty. And just as a, a historical note, um, sometimes um, like at one point we um, received a request from, from data coordinators um, that they wanted an additional list. Um, sometimes the people who are participating in the activities that we're putting on as a program, um, they're not technically staff. Um, they're, they're not technically a part of our LEND. They're not technically a part of our DBP. Um, and so where do we 
manage those staff? How, how can we manage those staff without entering them um, onto our pro public profiles? And so that's why we created this third option um, to add activity staff specifically for that purpose so that you can still list the staff involvement, but maybe those staff are not necessarily staff at your land or um, at your DBP. And so you can go into the admin data set and manage activity staff, um, and it's set up in a very similar way um, to the other uh, data sets that um, the, the directory um, and the managed users um, login that we've gone over so far. Um, you'll see uh, that there's a button to add new activity staff, um, the, their name, manage date they were added, and then who they were added by. If I want to edit an, exact, an existing record, then you can click on the three dots under manage and then click edit. Um, if you want to edit, if you delete, um, then it will prompt you. Um, and you just want to be careful before you agree because um, once you do confirm, um, their, their, their record can, cannot be retrieved. Um, deleting is final. And so um, let's add a new faculty, um, adding faculty staff, I think is probably one of the shortest forms that we have. It's um, very simple. You can, um, it's only just one question that's required. What is the name of the um, staff member that you're wanting to add for um, a staff involvement? And then you just enter their name. Um, best practices are to, of course, be very careful with spelling because it is um, spelling specific. Um, and then um, you can just save the screen. Um, and then if you want to edit, you can go back in and edit the information. Um, or if you want to delete, then um, you can delete their profile and click OK. And so just showing really quick where both of those fields are located um, in the activities um data set and in the projects again i'm just going to go into any activity and then the staff involvement field right here and then you also notice i'm um, in the staff involvement field that you can um, click to link them to that record um, and so we just want to make sure that they're in this um, draw to, this bottom um, drop down field too. And it's the same way in the products data set as well. Okay, staff involvement. Okay, so in the um, products um, data set, um, it is called the authors and organizations. Um, and so you'll notice it's the same process. You'll see the same list with your activity staff, and then you can add this person um, to add them um, for, for staff involvement in, in the products data set. I want to just stop here. Are there any um, questions um, or anything um, from the chat? We have lots of questions coming in. Um, so I'm going to go back to, um, let me look. I just want to make sure that I am not repeating any questions. OK. Mm -hmm. So similar to the NEARS login list question, but instead for the activity staff, there are people in our activity staff who are no longer with our program. Should we edit their access levels or should we delete them from the list? If we should delete them, will that erase their links to historical data they edited or anything like that? Which is very similar to another question we received. Yes. But <laughs> Brandon, do you want to answer that one first? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so activity staff, um, the it doesn't actually give them access. 
Um, the third kind of profile, it just so you can use them um, for those um, two questions that I just went over. Um, my approach, um, because they are linked with um, your records that are um, maybe reported to MCHB and the products data set, um, my uh, approach would be just to keep them in the manage activity staff. I, I would not remove them. Um, <clears throat> I won't clarify this point. Um, with profiles, as Brandon mentioned before, there are three types of profiles. First, NIRS account, people who can log in. Uh, second profile, directory profiles. This is your staff and faculty and staff. And the third type profile is uh, activities staff. If you notice, and Brandon, can you actually open directory list page? If you go in the directory, click manage list. Yes, and uh, if you click on three dots, edit for, for example, for Caroline Carey, you see her uh, options that you, you see here, what actions you can do. It's edit. The second option, view linked products and projects. This is where you see where you plug in that profile into your records. So you really don't want to delete that profile. If your free dots don't have this option, view relevant information, view linked project, product, or activities, it's your choice, delete or not delete profile. So if you go to admin, if you go to admin activities stuff, Brandon, can you please go there? Uh, oh. Yes, yeah, sorry. I, I just wanted to, to show, I was looking for an example of what Oksana just said. Um, and so if the records are linked with projects or products, um, then there will be the option, like she right. said, um, to view those linked products. If they are not, um, then those options will actually be different. It'll be edit, view, and then you'll have the option to delete. Right. Okay. So, and if you go, for example, in admin, the third category of users, activity stuff, and you click on this three dots for user, none of the users will have this option linked or view. So you set up, it's up to you. Do you want to keep the profile or you want to delete it? For historical record, I completely agree. We have this internal policy, which I try to implement, do not delete data. But if you really think it's okay, you can delete uh, those profiles that don't have data attached to that. And activity stuff will be, you should not be worried to, to lose those data because those data, those profiles, uh, we're saving them on the backend as a text. So even deleting Betty Lou Wills, we still preserve her name in that text area. Great. Yes. Excellent questions. So I think, Oksana, Brandon, you can stay there. There's many versions of the questions that were asked, um, but I do want to make sure I just ask all of them. Um, so there's another question, is the relationship between the directory listings and the activity staff, which I think we went through. I don't know if there's any additional questions about that relationship between the directory listings and the activity staff that would be good to mention. Uh, could you please uh, clarify the question? I'm sorry. They just asked, is there, a is there a relationship between the directory listings and the activity staff? This was an earlier question, so I, I think you've covered this, but just want to make oh. sure that they feel, um, for the person who asked this, if you feel like you don't have the answer to this. <laughs> um, okay, great. I just want to make sure I saw it in the chat. You did cover it. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, so there is, uh, let me look at these. I think you've covered this, but does deleting someone from activity staff delete the activities products associated with them? Um, Oksana, um, no. would you mind? Nope, nope. 
uh, dele deleting person from uh, administrator um, activity stuff list will not uh, delete products, uh, product records where those uh, were mentioned. Okay. And a similar question is, does deleting activity staff delete their name from an association with an activity or product? Nope. Again, um, Brandon just display how you add those names into the text box. That's process editing, preserve their names in the text area. So even if you delete that profile down the road, we still have that name saved in the relation with this product. So. Uh, everything preserved in, in a database and in your records, even if profile is gone. Great. And then we had a question about, we had duplicates of faculty and someone deleted the duplicates, but this caused issues with LPQI, um, which, stands, which stands for the LEND Program Quality Improvement Network, which is something separate <laughs> that we'll <laughs> mention later. Um, but there is a connection to LPQI if you're part of LEND um, with NEARS. Is there a way to see who deleted these entries or a way to restore? The short answer will be there is no way for us to restore those records. Um, the, your, I'm not sure, I would advise against create duplicates. Uh, I would create one profile that will work for log in into NEARS and LPQI. Okay. Great. Um, and there is a comment that I'll just mention. It, it says it would be great if we could differentiate between active activity staff and inactive. I don't want to delete staff for reasons we talked about earlier, but it'd be great if the dropdown only included active staff. Um, okay, dropping down. Oh, and the response that seems to the answer to my question is that we can delete the inactive staff from the list. And then Joan had, what happens with a name change? For example, if someone changes from a married to maiden name or vice versa, does it change the historical data attached to that person? Or will the older years show with the old name? Uh, it there is a connection between records, projects, uh, and products, um, but connection to the profile. So if you will update profile to the new name, it will display new name everywhere and going back uh, also to the historical records. Yeah. So, for example, if um, Carrie Caroline had a name change um, and she has records associated um, with her profile, looks like she has three. Um, whenever I clicked on the view linked um, projects and products, um, if we were to change her her name, it, it would then um, update um, in those in those listings whenever um, we, we would search for her. Is that correct? Right. Great. Um, we have a question from Matt. So the online faculty and staff directory is different from activity staff, and it populates fields for project slash product contacts. Do the profiles need to be active and displayed to populate the contact fields? Yes. Um... Brennan, can you please go to the projects or oh, products? Products, okay. Um, add a new product. Just sure. any, any product, okay. Okay, the first field that you see in for the products, it's offers. And if you click on that offer, you will see that that list will come from activity stuff. So there is no active or uh, display or not display, everything that in that list will be displayed here. Everybody. The, you remember simplest entrance, you just enter first and last name. So for that list, what you enter in 
uh, active uh, staff list, that what you will see in offer organization. The second field, if you scroll down to the bottom of your form, you will see ordering information. This is information that will be published on a UCD website in near search. So that need to be person from your faculty that if somebody wants to contact your center about this product, then you, they can they can they would contact to that person. So here you will see status next to the name, and uh, um, that list display only two statuses, display or not display in directory. And the reason we've done that, remember I tried to explain active or not active people. So act your faculty and staff, active people have display and do not display uh, on the public website statuses. You can assign one or another uh, if you want to hide people from, from the uh, online presence on the UCD website. So here you can, you can see that if, when you select person, you know if, it will be, if his profile or her profile will be available on online directory. Everything else, all other statuses, inactive, as we talk, waiting for approval, uh, rejected, will not be displayed in that list. Great, and you just received another question. So do you need to enter the same person for each profile or is there a link from directory or to activity staff and or NEARS users? Here the strategy with IPRO, Th those are two different lists. And I think um, Brandon, when he talked about that, he gave you distinct uh, definition. Your directory, those are your employee. Those are people who actually working on the ground or somehow uh, uh, part of your center, um, their definition faculty and staff. Activity list. Um, staff list is list of people who potentially work with you as a collaborators. They're not um, a faculty or staff. They're not um, relate to your center. Um, they, they collaborate maybe on a project. Uh, they may be part of other people from other centers, but you want to mention them. Um, on your, uh, in this case, in your product records. So like you want to highlight your collaborative effort between several centers. That's when you're using uh, activity staff list. You put those people there. So there is clear, distinct, though those lists are uh, very different. There is no overlap. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Oksana, this is Chrissy. I asked the question. Um, I guess my question is, once we put them in the directory, are they automatically entered into the activity staff and NEARS user, or do we have to go in and do it automatically? Separately? As long as they have okay. status uh, display or not display and nothing else, they will be automatically displaying that uh, pull down list. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah. As long as you um, set their their status, um, so the, the, this is Brandon again. Um, as long as you you click display, then that will automatically be updated. I mean, you, you just have to make sure that the if you want them displayed, that display is selected. No, wait, right? wait, Brandon. The question so, was about activities data set pull down list, right? Oh, I am so Christia, sorry. Okay. Right. So not okay. the display on. Uh, AUCD directory online. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Yes. Um, uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah. So if we were to, um, so here, let's um, demo this together really quick. Um, and so I'm going to add um, myself um, to this list because I'm not on the uh, activity um, staff drop down list. I'm going to save 
Um, and then, um, and so now I check down here, I am now listed um, down here. I, I wasn't before. And then I'm gonna go back to the products data set. I'm gonna add a new record. And then I'm gonna go and find that field. You'll now see I'm now the fourth option there. And so that automatically updated in years whenever I added that in the admin activity staff. Yep, and exactly the same scenarios happen if you add in the directory, you add staff or faculty. That person will automatically will be added to the list. Yes. I was going, um, I thought that the question was, the question was actually, is the directory a subset of the activity staff? No. It's two separate sets. I mean, the person who asked question may, may clarify. If we answer that question, maybe we, we missed it. No, you, you answered the way okay. my, my question was. I was wondering if we, like we have new faculty and staff. So when I enter them in the directory, they will automatically be entered as activity staff. They yeah, they'll be... appear in the, in the drop down, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you're talking about directory. So let, let's just kind of, the terminology may be confusing. So you add faculty here and you will see new name. That name will be displayed if you go in the projects or products. Let, let's stick with products. Okay. Less confusing. So <laughs> that name will be displayed at the contact information at the bottom. You don't need to do anything here. It will automatically show up. Okay, if you want to add new name to the, uh, Brendan, can you click away? Mm -hmm. Yes, so if you add profile to the activity staff and the admin, uh, admin activity, activity staff, staff, okay. Brendan just added himself, that name, Will this will be displayed in a different field in the products? It will be offers. So there are we're looking at the products. There are two pull down lists. One, Brendan, and if you can go products, products, mm -hmm. uh, add product. There are two pull down lists one offers that list associated with activity staff list where actually Brandon just added himself at the top of the list here. This is one list and it's managed like completely independently from directory. If you add profile in the directory the faculty staff, that profile will be displayed in the list name and the ordering information section. And it will display automatically as soon as you add it in the directory section. Yes. Christy, everybody else? <laughs> Is it clear? There are two lists directory online and uh, uh, activity stuff. The information goes to the two different lists. I see a comment that says that makes sense. <laughs> so <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's hard to, to talk when, <laughs> yes, great. But a new question came in. So, and for those that as the questions are coming in since we have time for questions, you can also feel free to unmute, but I will read your question if you put it in the chat. Um, so, uh, Kristen asks, so if I want someone from the directory list to show up in the author pull down, I have to enter, I have to enter them into activity staff. Yes, exactly. Yes. 
Great. And no need to ask offline. This is what yeah. this is part of the, the boot camp is for. Yeah. Um, we try to allow for questions, um, you know, because so we're learning experience um, and, and everyone to have hands on experience. So please, we love the questions. Great. Well, it looks like that's all the questions that I see in the chat. Feel free for those that if I missed any questions or something has just come up, you can either put it in the chat or unmute um, yourself. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, and so then I think the um, last, we have two more things to go over um, than today, um, but I think maybe a 10 minute break um, would be um, that we, we could do a 10 minute break and so we can come back at around 4.20 um, um, and then we'll um, start back in um, on the last two topics.
So hello and welcome back everyone. Um, I'll give it just a one more minute for everyone to um, ch chime back in for the next part of the session. Okay, well, welcome back everyone. Um, so um, before we get into the next uh, section for today, um, I wanted uh, to demo logging into NEARS again, um, since I know many of you, this might be your first time. So I just wanted to um, demo how to do that again. Um, and so from the, website that I linked in the email earlier today. Um, the very first thing um, that uh, during the boot camp, I just want everyone to get into the habit of doing is just making sure that we have the right test web website at the very top of our screen, just to make sure that we're logging into the test center and NEARS, um, which will be separate from the actual login um, that, that you would typically use um, for your centers. Um, we just made the separate login so that you can have the opportunity um, to enter data um, without um, impacting anything um, that might be used for federal reporting. Um, and so you can do that in a free um, and safe environment. The next thing that I'm going to do um, is that I'm going to uh, select the correct center type. Um, again, if you're a you said or a lend, it'll default um, to that, but I just want to double check up here and make sure that I'm in the right test um, center link. Um, for PPCs, LIAs, and DBPs, I'm going to click on the login here link. Um, and then um, after that, um, you can go in, make sure you select the correct type if you're from a DBP. Um, then you can select the test center for the DBP. If you're from a test center from a LIA, um, then you can select that. And then you can put in your username and your password information. Um, everyone was sent um, username and login information. Um, it's the your, your first name underscore um, and then the first letter of your um, last name for your password. The first letter of your first name and the first letter of your last name will both be capitalized in your password. Let me quickly correct it, Brandon. What I'm, you I'm just said will be username, not password. I am so sorry. OK. Yeah. Yep. Um, OK, I, Oksana, would you mind? Um... Uh, OK, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> the, the logic, um, username, whatever you will be putting on the uh, row below your center where you currently see B. Lewis, your first name, underscore, and first letter of your last name. Uh, capitalization doesn't matter. Um, just keep the format. Next line will be password. Password will be word nears. And next will be abbreviation of your center, whatever you register with. If it will you set slash land, you will put nears you set land. No separation between words is a one word. If you register with DBP, your password will be NIRS DBP. No separation, one word. If you register as a LIA, your password will be NIRS LIA. Again, one word. If you register with LAND, your password will be uh, NIRS LAND. OK. OK. Thank you, Oksana. Sure. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure that was um, you know, accurate and everything. So um, OK. So um, 
again, if you get stuck logging in, please let us know. We can double check to make sure that your login information is correct. Um, we're happy to help in any way that we can. And so you log in um, and then you'll see um, the dashboard um, and you'll be good to go. Success. Um, super exciting. Okay. Um, and so I just wanted to walk through that process really quick again. Brandon, there's a question. Um, can we use the test page to train people in our organization? Um, Oksana, were we planning to keep these logins open? We did not plan to keep those logins open, but uh, if you will request to keep that account, we will keep your account op open. Please contact us with nears at AUCD.org, our traditional mail. Um, if we're not hear from you after probably like three, four months, we will delete those accounts. Um, and after the boot camp too, I did also want to mention we have a test center on the live. Um, version. Um, if, if in the future, after the boot camp, um, we're happy to set up um, uh, logins in the, in the test center as well, just um, send us a message. And, and I'm happy to, to do that as well. Thanks. That was it. For okay. questions. Wonderful questions, everyone. Okay. So um, the Next thing that I wanted to introduce for everyone, um, we have, as we mentioned earlier, we have the AUCD online directory search. Um, and I just wanted to show that I, where that was again. Um, that's on AUCD homepage. Um, we'll get the ITAC um, link fixed um, for everyone, but we also have one for the lens and use ads. Um, on the page, um, which is in the very top corner. Um, you can click on the map and um, then you can select any of the states. Um, or if you want to search by different expertise um, or disciplines, we, that is also um, an option on the directory as well. And uh, Brandon, can I just chime in for very short comment? Mm -hmm. uh, we we would recommend use this uh, online directory on a UCD website if you're looking for collaboration between land and USETs, because here at the top right corner under the header browse or search program, there is a link, uh, no, uh, Brandon, um, to the right from the map. Okay. Yes. yes there is a link display combined directory. That directory display land and you sets. We don't have DBPs on a UCD website. For that directory, uh, land and DBPs, you will need to go to ITAG website. Mm -hmm. That's the difference between these two online directories. So if you think you sets land, go to a UCD website. If you just staying inside of the MCHB program, it's a tech website. So thank you, Oksana. Um, and that that is a, a very good point too. I, I did not mention um, both of the profiles have the combined directory option that you can browse by. Um, and so if you're wanting to you know, maybe throw like a wide net whenever you're doing your searches, um, you can just make sure you click the um, browse com combined directory um, and it'll include all of the um, programs that are included on the search. Okay. Do we have any questions about that piece? Not in the chat. Okay. Okay, so um, then I just wanted to go through the um, public search just a little bit more. Again, I will hope that um, Dr. Sarah O'Kelly, if she's on the line, will forgive me for using for her as an example. <laughs> um, but- um, I'm fine with it, thank you. <laughs> so thank you so much, Sarah. Um, 
So I, I want to return back uh, to the directory profile just so we can kind of see how these fields are coming together in the online directory. Um, and so we've talked a little bit like the first name, last name, their login information. Um, and then whenever you get to the position fields, um, you might think, um, okay, so there are a lot of options here. How is that, you know, coming together in the online form? How is that being, um, how is that being put to the um, network whenever, um, you know, it's being posted on the online directory? Um, and so if we go through here, we can see here that in the leadership section, Dr. Sarah O'Kelly is listed as a LEN director. And then we scroll a little bit farther down and then we can also find her name as a primary activity coordinator on the clinical services. And so I just wanna go back over here and so we can see leadership. If I was on the um, test center um, for the LENs, I, mean, I can go back over there really quick. Um, and go back on to the selection. Let me um, log out really quick and um, demonstrate that really quick. Okay. And again, I'm logging in with my AUCD Uber account. And so some of the options here, um, you might see them just slightly different from, from what you're viewing. Um, but if I, um, again, go back over here um, to those same fields in the position, um, what, what I'm trying to um, I'm get at is that under leadership, I mean, there's that Lynn director field. Um, and we can see here next to Dr. Sarah O'Kelly, um, that LEND leadership option is also selected here. Um, and then I'm sure if we were to go to her actual profile, I don't, I don't want to show her actual profile because that would give personal information um, that I don't want to show on um, a call with everyone. But um, whenever um, you would scroll down here, you can see also the primary activity staff. Um, and clinical services, she's also selected um, a, as a clinical services um, and the primary activity coordinators as well. And so we can see um, that that's also an option in the primary activity coordinators. We can find uh, clinical, clinical services right up here at the very top. And down on the list, um, you'll see um, that that is um, how it is, um, you know, d displayed on the directory. If we were to also go to for discipline coordinator, I'm sure she would also have those options selected as well. And so it we it was set up this way um, at request of data coordinators because they wanted a very easy way. Um, for someone in the network, let's say a, a policymaker were to come to the directory um, and they're looking for someone who is an expertise, I'm in Alabama, um, who is an expert in clinical services. Um, and then they can just go through here and be like, okay, so who, um, you know, who, who is a good person to contact? Or I want to contact leadership um, in, in the LIN program or the DBP program. And they can just find that very, very easily. Um, on here for, um, and, and then they can just find your contact information. It, it flows um, very well um, and you can find the expertise um, very, very easily. Um, and so did, is, are, there, are there any questions on how that's kind of showing up in, in the directory um, and how that is on the directory form directly in NEARS? Brandon, there's no questions in the chat unless folks want to unmute. And till they they making that decision about next question, I quickly add that there is uh, information on um, 
directory um, online form and it's listed as additional information. Um, it's personal information where we uh, where we're asking about gender, primary language, um, race, um, when you started with the center, primary employment role, and so on. That information is not shared uh, on uh, AUCD public website. This is information that uh, we store in NIRS and NIRS only. Um, there is a historical uh, record in the past faculty profiles was shared with MCHB and was exported on annual basis, not anymore. That practice was, was done by 2018. So, but the historical kind of form, we preserve it for your internal use. If you need any reports on your faculty and staff, you can use NIRS for that purposes. Um, and so then if there are no other questions, um, I'm just going to click into Sarah's um, profile really quick just to get a little bit more um, into it. Um, and so just to kind of show, um, like you can see that like her research interests, her education, all of these things are also outlined whenever you click directly into her profile. She's also added a, a really nice um, bio um, that, that you can read um, on what her other interests are if you have any interest as well. Okay. Um, and so that's what I wanted to um, show for the directory data set. Um, we, we've also been talking a lot about the public search, um, that the things that you can, um, that you have entered into NIRS and your projects and products, um, those can be searched um, as well for the network um, and are highlighted um, to, to the network if anyone um, wants to find um, information on certain topics um, and then they can find contact information. Um, I, I also wanted to show where that search can be found on our website. Um, we'll be covering those a lot more in day three as well, um, but I just kind of wanted to show everyone um, where that information is on our website. And that's again on our AUCD um, homepage. Um, I'll zoom in a little bit because I realize that's really tiny. Um, it's again in this NIRS box. Um, and then you'll see that there's the login underneath the login, there's search for network projects and products. It'll take you to this search page um, and it's separated out into projects and products. We'll go through those a lot more in day three. Um, but this is really the meat and potatoes where people from across the world can, um, you know, search for the amazing work um, that your programs do across the country. Um, if they're interested in finding something um, for on a certain topic, like, for example, autism, then they can go in here and they can see what's going around the country around autism. Um, and, and then they can find programs who are doing uh, recent work on, on that particular topic and find contact information for it. Um, and so um, I, I'm just going to demonstrate this really quick. Um, and so I'm just going to select a couple of different, like if I'm looking for, for books, um, particularly for, for finished products, what came out of those activities that are count going on at your program. Um, and then I can also make any selections for um, the current year, for the years of program. Um, I'm sorry, I for, I'm going to backtrack a little bit um, because at the very top of the screen, it does ask you to search for um, USEDs and LENS as well. And then you can select um, it, what, what, what you're searching for. Um, and then you can search um, for um, whatever years you're interested in. I'm just going to go um, from this current year and then I'm going to enter in um, autism, for example, for the keywords. And then you can search. Um, it doesn't 
And then it looks like we got a couple of um, results back. I mean, you can scroll through here and you can see what's going on. You can click into each of them um, and read more about them. Um, really nice and awesome uh, a feature that we have here is that their um, contact information um, that uh, was displayed, um, you can see in the products data set, um, we have that contact field that we've been talking about um, in, in the products data set. If I were to go back again, add a product, and then scroll to the bottom of the page, that the contact information is listed. That's, that's, that's where this information is listed from, and it goes in, into the products in the online search. If you want to, you can also select different options here, and then you can download the search, um, and then that'll take that onto your desktop and, and, and an Excel file. Um, and then you can um, kind of have that information compiled for you on a certain topic. Brandon, may I jump in? Yeah, of course. I just wanted to mention, this is Jackie again, that this is a really great resource to finding out, as Brandon mentioned, of what's happening in the network. I receive so many questions sometimes of, you know, what's happening in the territories or, you know, I'm looking for someone who is an expert in autism, mental health on the West Coast. And, you know, while I have my own resources of, um, of what folks are doing, I also use the public search to there may be programs or projects that are happening that I'm not aware of. So I know the AUCD staff really utilizes this public search as well. Um, so just wanted to reiterate that point. Yeah, exactly. I get a lot of questions about um, how to find different resources across the country too. Um, and I cannot tell you how valuable this search tool is. Um, I mean, it's been really amazing to learn about all the different work that's been going across the country just by doing a, a few um, quick searches on the search tool. Okay, I'm gonna stop um, sharing then. Um, I'm gonna turn it back uh, to Jackie. Um, if she could please, um, uh, share the slides from the uh, beginning of the meeting again, please. I think my Zoom just crashed. <laughs> did, did I go out for a minute? I can I get them up so. instead. Yeah, so you're, I think I might have them too. Oh, oh thank I, you. Okay. I think they're up. I apologize. <laughs> I, my Zoom keeps crashing on me. So, um, Rachel, if you could have them as a backup, that would be fantastic. Um, and I will go on mute and let Brandon take it from here. Okay. So, thank you so much, Jackie. Um, and so really that concludes um, what we were wanting to demonstrate in NEARS um, for today, for the very first day of the boot camp. I know that was a lot of information, um, but again, please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, we have TA hours that we will also be hosting that I sent calendar invites on earlier. Um, those will be hosted on Mondays and Thursdays of every day of the boot camp. Um, and we also have those listed for you on the slides that were sent to. Um, and so we have a couple of homework items. Um, these are completely optional. And um, these are, um, we really do encourage them because they're a great opportunity for you to get some hands-on experience, um, as well as get an opportunity to um, provide any feedback for us and to get uh, direct feedback um, from us as well. Um, and so for, we have a couple of um, homework um, items. Um, the very first piece of homework um, that will be um, how to log in. Um, the very first question will ask you to log in um, to your appropriate test center. Um, we'll make sure that you have access. Um, again, make sure um, message us at nears at AUCD.org. Um, if you um, have any um, trouble with the homework, we're happy to help. Um, 
And then the next uh, piece of homework, um, you'll be asked to create two NIRS ad, uh, logins um, in the Manage NIRS logins page. One for NIRS administrator of all data sets. Um, and then I provided an example of what that should look like if you've done it successfully. Um, what that will look like is that you'll create the login and then you'll double check, you'll find that same login that you just created in the dropdown. Um, you'll return back to the manage users login and the admin data set, make sure that that's saved correctly. And then you'll log out and then log back in with that new um, login that you just created. If you've done it correctly, the top ribbon um, will look um, just like it is. Um, you'll have the dashboard trainees, projects, and so on and so forth. The second NIRS login um, will be read write owned for activities and products data sets only. And so this is um, this person will only be able to access activities and products information in NIRS. And you'll follow that same process. You'll create their login. You'll um, check to make sure that it is saved correctly um, and then you'll log out and log in with that um, near that 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 new login um, and i'm sorry megan did, did were there any questions that you had okay okay um and then the uh, third question um, will be to submit an AUCD online profile as a faculty member. Um, just a quick note that Leah and PPCs uh, may skip this question. Um, PPC and Leah programs do not have AUCD online directories, um, but uh, LENS um, and DBPs do. I mean, so you'll be able to practice with the online directories. And so you'll practice making uh, directory profiles both directly in NIRS um, and on the online AUC directory like we practiced um, during today's boot camp. And I provided links. Um, we do have separate links for um, the test version of NIRS. And so um, just make sure you use the, the correct links that we've provided on the slides. Um, and this is um, using uh, the um, directly in years. So there, there's two separate questions for it. And then we have uh, two questions um, that will be, one will be multiple choice and then the other one will be fill in the blank. Um, this will be um, kind of gets you familiar with the um, directory. Um, even further on where you find where you can edit um, your center program address, telephone number, um, and social media platforms. And we have a couple of options outlined for you. And then the last question of the homework um, will be uh, where you can gain access to the NEARS learning modules, um, which is not something that I I'm really touched over. And we have a lot of really helpful resources um, and, and TA um, resources on our NEARS resource page. And so I've um, given a link where you can kind of explore that information. Um, and then I've also provided the um, office TA hours. Um, Month, uh, on uh, Thursday the 19th um, from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. will be available for any questions. Um, and then on Monday, um, January 23rd from 4.30 to 5 p.m. EST um, for any questions as well. We will also start for with the, the next session of the boot camp for any questions um, too, if, if there are any. Um, I did want to pause here. Is there anything um, that um, Jackie Oksana um, wanted to add on to that before we go into closing remarks? We're good. Yeah, I think we're good. Thanks. Okay. Of course. Okay. Well, we're very excited. Um, first day of the um, boot camp. Um, and so, of course, um, have some homework if you're interested in doing that. Um, and there will be in addition to 
um, what um, we have um, gone over for today. You can kind of get some hands-on experience, like I said. Um, and we'll hope to see you at the TA hours um, that are Monday and Thursday. Um, please let us know how we did for our first day of the boot camp. We have a survey monkey, um, and we're always welcome to any feedback that you have. Um, there's a QR code on the screen um, that you can um, fill out the form. It should take maybe five to 10 minutes at most. Um, and we very much appreciate any feedback that you have for us. Um, and then the survey link is also in the chat. Um, I did want to give a special thank you to MCHB for joining us today as well. Um, and our car captioners and AMSL interpreters want to give a special shout out for them as well. Um, we look forward to seeing everyone in day two of the boot camp. Um, we'll be on the line until everyone has logged out um, if there are any additional questions. Brandon, I just had one question um, before we run away today. <laughs> okay. um, just uh, so I had been talking with my supervisor about getting our directory page up to date. So I'm really glad that we went over that today. Um, and I was able to find a lot of the edits that needed to be done as we were going through um, today on my own page. Um, but I just have a last question of do we need phone numbers in the directory page? Uh, that is a very good question. Um, and so I would caution against putting, you know, like your, like their personal information, like their personal phone number, um, but you can put like your, your center phone number um, or, or something mm -hmm. like that on, on the profile if you wish. Okay, because I only ask because right now we don't have like a, um, it's a center, it's not a center, it's only a program. Um, so we don't have like an office or an office phone. <laughs> um, so I, I wasn't sure what to do with that. Um, um, I think it really depends on your comfort level. Yeah. <laughs> um, because if you even just go and it looks like we'll need to, um, you know, make sure that the iTech directory is up, um, although you can still use the, AUC, the directory that's on the AUCD website. I just clicked on a couple and most have numbers, although I know some of these folks and some of these are personal cell phone numbers. So I guess it really depends on your comfort level. I This website, as you know, is a public website, although most of our <laughs> membership goes to these websites. So I would recommend trying to find some number, uh, whether mm -hmm. that's you know, some people have like mm -hmm. Google phone numbers that can be directed to your cell phone, but it's not your direct cell phone number. Right. Something like that. Um, I know I give my phone number out to um, network members, but I wouldn't necessarily put it on a website. So, uh, right. I only ask be because it's it's actually a required field for mm -hmm. like when you add like someone to the directory. So like most of my core faculty are okay with giving me their phone number, but like definitely don't want it broadcasted. So mm -hmm. like, should I just put like the like Google Voice Center number on all of them or? <laughs> you know I, if that's your <laughs> yeah. I want to talk to you, Michelle but um yes I would try to find something that isn't your personal cell phone number um just because you know spam bots could get to that you know and we don't oh, yeah. want to spam you um so I know that some folks use like a Google and I'd have to I don't really use it so I don't know the ins and outs of it and maybe Oksana does but I know they have like a Google number that reroutes to your personal yeah. cell phone number. And that might be what I would recommend. I would just, if anything changes, if you, you know, if your program does have a number that you could create, um, just making sure the directory is up to date for that. But yeah, I don't know, Oksana, Brandon, do you have any other do thoughts you... on how to go around? That? No, I think it's like, <laughs> I'm even more strict with JK because I see uh, amount of spam and amount of uh, ransom attack on, for example, our list serves. It's happened regularly. So I would probably even say go even further, post a phone number for your 
department. I mean, you at university, and I know, for example, my, my husband, he's several centers, but he just posting his um, department number. So maybe even put something that like that official. Okay, that's okay. And, Thank you. Yeah, I think I'll do that um, for the right. definitely for the core faculty as well. Right, exactly. And when it, when you guys maybe will have your phone, then you will update, go and update everybody's phone. But uh, definitely, uh, phone number is very sensitive information, and I really don't want to be. Uh, I actually have it. I actually have a direct line to my office, but nobody uses it. Yeah, I mean. Yes, I, I situations <laughs> I can be like oh, all from A to Z. If you have this, this is great. Uh, definitely put your. But if not, maybe I would just go like department phone number at the university and put it for everyone, just okay. to be safe. Then sorry. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. I wasn't sure what to do. That's a great suggestion, though. So, <laughs> thank you. Of course. All right, thank you guys. I'll bop off now. Okay. Have a good rest of the evening. You too. Any other questions? Some may have walked away from their computers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's look like we ended early. Yeah.